All right, what's poppin'? It's your boy, Big Rich, Mob Story, Season 2, Queens, New York City, where we get busy. Gentlemen, you know the rules. Let's continue on with the Stephen Crea story. I think this is part five. First of all, salute to Justice Tech Pros, Dominic, and the whole team. Make sure you subscribe to their YouTube channel. And also, I'm going to try to get as many parts out of the story that I can before June 5th, because on June 5th, the whole audio book of this article will be found at www.guiltforthegiltless.com. Again, www.guiltforthegiltless.com. And the whole audio book of this article that was written by Lisa Babic, a.k.a. MS, salute, salute. Uh, you're going to find it there, but Big Rich is going to do his, uh, his best to get as many parts out before that day. So let's get right into business. And, of course, salute to Justice Tech Pros for sponsoring uh, this video, right? Let's get right into it. Guilt for the Guiltless, the story of Stephen Crea, the murder of Michael Meldish, and other tales. This is part five. The ends justify the means. The FBI has a long history of working with informants, and as we can see in this case, many of the government's informants aren't necessarily the cream of the crop. There are some very famous cases. Gregory, Scarpa, Sr., and Whitey Bulger come to mind of FBI agents engaging in rather slimy schemes to get their target, including providing names and addresses of other informants who were subsequently killed. There have even been cases where prosecutors have allowed and even encouraged informants to lie on the stand. In the case of Joseph Barboza, his false testimony resulted in six men being convicted of murder in 1968. Four of the men were 100% innocent, but by the time the truth was revealed, Two of the men had died in prison, and the other two had already served 30 years behind bars. The prosecutors involved were never brought to justice. In their 2017 indictment, Crea and Joseph Detello were charged with the attempted assault and murder of Sean Richard in retaliation for the decision by Richard to provide information to law enforcement. Detello, acting with the blessing of Crea Sr., traveled to New Hampshire to find, assault, and kill Richard. While this particular event might not be as notable as Barboza's, what happened behind the scenes is disturbingly familiar. Sean Richard was the former son-in-law of this guy on the screen, John Regi, a one-time alleged boss of the Di Cavalcante family. He had also been a business partner and close friend of the Tello in the construction industry in the 90s. In 2000, Richard was one of 37 defendants along with Crea and Datello who were facing charges of labor racketeering. Instead of facing the music, he decided to become a state witness in exchange for a new identity and a reduced sentence of five years probation. A disgracia! He claimed the reason he did it was that he feared Datello and had been given orders to kill him. It was also later revealed that he stiffed Datello of a $200,000 loan. Both Crea and Datello took plea bargains in that case and were sentenced to three years each. After testifying in that trial, Richards left his wife and two young children to enter the WITSEC program with a stripper he had fallen in love with while he was still married. Not only did he abandon his family, he also left them bankrupt and nearly homeless. His soon-to-be ex-wife was facing foreclosure on her home. And like most of the informants in the government's arsenal, Richard was a drug addict and a drunk who self-admittedly used pot, cocaine, and heroin. None of it bothered Richard. He had a new life to look forward to. In a September 8, 2000 interview with the New York Times, he boasted about upcoming movie and book deals, his new look, and how proud he was of being a rat. The last thing anyone wants is to be a rat, he said. But you know something? I'll be a rat and I won't go to prison. A disgracia. I'll be a rat and I'll be alive. So what was the lowdown on the attempted murder of Sean Richard? Let's take a trip down this dark and dirty path. The role of a lifetime. Robert De Niro Spinelli was a lifelong drug abuser who had been in trouble with the law since the 1980s, serving numerous prison terms for drug trafficking and other crimes. He became a government informant in 2012. A disgracia! Although his brother is alleged Lucchese soldier Michael Spinelli, Robert De Niro himself was basically a nobody who was only known around the neighborhood as Mike's brother. In 1998, he was convicted and sentenced to 10 years in prison for a failed March 1992 murder attempt on Patricia Capozzalo, the sister of alleged Lucchese shoulder 
Peter Chiodo, who had flipped and was set to testify in a racketeering and murder trial of alleged Lucchese boss Vicar Musso. According to Gangland, at the time of Robert De Niro's sentencing, and that's him on the screen, his lawyers sought leniency from the court by claiming his client had an IQ of only 63, which classified him as mentally defective on the Wessler Adult Intelligence Scale. Hard to believe a guy who reportedly graduated from Rutgers University in 1993 with a Bachelor of Science in Sports Management and Exercise Science and attended an undetermined number of graduate classes at the New Jersey Institute of Technology earning fewer than six credits, could have such a low IQ. But perhaps that IQ lie was part of his role-playing shtick. Even though he told that lie to the Superior Court in New Jersey in February 2019, eight months before he was set to testify in Korea's trial. But we'll get to that later. In 2011, Spinelli was charged with two counts of aggravated assault on a police officer, resisting arrest, possession of a weapon for an unlawful purpose, unlawful possession of a weapon, drug possession, and possession of drug paraphernalia after a traffic stop in Brick, New Jersey. The arresting officer had noticed Spinelli, who had multiple outstanding warrants on him, getting into the passenger side of a pickup truck. As he approached the vehicle, Spinelli tried to flee by taking control of the wheel from the driver. He didn't succeed. During a search of the vehicle after Spinelli was subdued, Officers found a 5-inch steak knife, screwdriver, and copper mesh commonly used as drug paraphernalia underneath Spinelli's seat. Two glass smoking pipes were recovered from his pocket. He was facing four years for the charges but found a way out by going to the FBI and offering his services. A disgracia! In exchange, he received a reduced sentence of only six months and started wearing a wire for the FBI in April of 2012, three months after he supposedly met Terry Caldwell. Plus, he had an Amuso connection. He claimed he had been his messenger. In 2013, shortly after the Meldish murder, and since he had already had an in, Spinelli was partnered with an undercover agent by the name of Pete to find out everything he could about the murder and the possible involvement of Crea and Madonna. It was a dream come true for Spinelli. Court documents reveal Spinelli became an informant to get back at Maddie because he claimed Maddie didn't give him money that he supposedly promised after Spinelli had gotten out of jail. And he didn't get made, which was supposedly part of the agreement as well. He was more than a little upset that Madonna reportedly told him to get a job when he came around looking for that money. While Spinelli pursued his ultimate target, he also more than happily pursued the FBI's ultimate target, Crea, interjecting his name in nearly every conversation he had because that's what Agent Otto wanted him to do. Get the guy, Crea, in the conversation. After figuring out all the details with his handlers, Spinelli set his sights on Joseph Datello, one of the people he thought would get him and the FBI closer to their main target because Datello was a friend and former business partner of Crea's, and they both had dealings with Sean Richard. And the federal government was paying Spinelli very handsomely for his services, too. He even quit his job to work full-time for the FBI. Court documents revealed he was being paid a salary of 4500 per month. Plus, the FBI leased at least two new cars for him. First, a Nissan Altima, then an upgrade to a Nissan Maxima. They picked up his car and medical insurance, as well as any travel expense he had, including gas and his Easy Pass. They paid for several storage units and even bought him clothes. In fact, he once asked them to buy him a cashmere sweater. They pay all my expenses, he boasted in court testimony. Court documents also revealed that while Spinelli was earning his salary from the FBI trying to implicate Crea and others, he was stealing from his employer and committing other crimes as well. While he was selling his illegal cigarettes to various people, he would tack on an extra $5 per carton and pocket the money. He was also selling oxycodone pills, pot, and cocaine on the side. He stored the cigarettes and drugs in the FBI-funded storage units where he also made his cocaine deals with guys from Miami. Wow. The feds, man. Unreal. In addition, he had filed a false insurance claim lying that his house had been broken into and all of his non-existent expensive jewelry had been stolen. And even though his new rides were being paid for by the government, he had to get the bank loans on his own, you know, so it looked like it was on the up and up. When he went to trade his old pre-informant vehicle for his brand spanking new one, he couldn't get the loan because of his poor credit score, so he lied to the salesman about his salary and got the car anyway. 
basically a fraudulent bank loan application. After all his hard work for the previous four years, Spinelli was put into the WITSEC program. He signed his cooperation agreement on April 21, 2017 and pled guilty to all the crimes he committed while working for the FBI and others prior to his new job, including racketeering and extortion. And yet, like the Energizer Bunny, he kept going and going and going and going. The mentally defective and lying Energizer Bunny on December 13, 2017, Spinelli left the scene of an accident in South Brunswick, New Jersey, after colliding with a vehicle stopped in front of him. The other vehicle's drivers followed Spinelli where he had stopped several blocks away. When police arrived, Spinelli appeared intoxicated and had a cut above his eye, which happened when he hit his head on the steering wheel during the crash. Spinelli refused medical treatment, denied being intoxicated, and said that he was hypoglycemic. He failed the field sobriety test, and when the breath analyzer result came back, it was found that his blood alcohol count was three times over the legal limit. He was charged with a DWI and reckless driving. Two days later, police added a charge of child endangerment because his 14-year-old son was in the car with him while he was driving drunk. Spinelli fought the charges and attempted to get into New Jersey State Pretrial Intervention Program, PTI, which is designed to give first-time offenders a second chance. When state prosecutors denied his request, he accused them of patent and gross abuse of discretion and appealed the decision. His lawyers claimed that prosecutors had unduly focused on the negative factors and failed to give proper weight to defendants' character, traits, and rehabilitative efforts. Although he had two prior DUI convictions, he told the court that society would be better served by his admission into PTI, where he can learn the lesson from his mistakes and return to work and care for his family. He added that there was simply nothing in the record to justify the prosecutor's reliance on a pattern of antisocial behavior. By the way, by the way, not only did Spinelli lie about his Rutgers University degree, but he also told the appeals court that he was employed as a sales manager, supervising over 20 employees and had worked at the company for 21 years. He also claimed that he had no prior involvement with the criminal justice system, which at this point probably would have been wiped out by the good old USA because he had already signed the cooperation agreement. In 2018, he won the appeal. However, state prosecutors fought back and a higher court reversed the lower court's decision. This was August 7, 2019, two months before Korea's October trial. Despite knowing all of Spinelli's serious offenses while he was working for the government, prosecutors still fought tooth and nail to prevent Korea from getting bail. During bail hearings in 2017 and 2018, Prosecutors claimed they possessed audio recordings taken by Spinelli of the Tello discussing the attempted murder of Richard that proved, just like the indictment said, he had Kriya's blessing. Assistant U.S. Attorney Jacqueline Kelly informed the court that, in 2016, Joseph the Tello got a tip about where the witness was located and then made attempts to find them, including by traveling to a location where he believed the witness to be and waited outside the house for him to emerge. Joseph Tatello recounts all this in a recorded conversation with our confidential source, and he makes clear to our confidential source of some of these consensual recordings that he needed Stephen Crea's okay to carry out the killing. So initially, he reports that Stephen Crea would be happy if this resulted, and that's in a conversation in 2017, but a month later, because of different things that are going on in this case, in fact, after the initial indictment in this case was filed charging Christopher Landanio and Terrence Caldwell with the murder of Michael Meldish, the teller reports that Stephen Crea had told him to back off because of the heat that was on the family at the time. Because Crea told the teller to back off at that point, the teller tells the confidential sort that he has to wait. So he has to wait for the approval. He can't act without the approval of Kriya, so those plans are put on hold. But again, this is after the okay was given and Detello made extensive attempts to locate the witness to carry out the killing. These alleged recordings were a major part of why both father and son Kriya were denied bail because this was more evidence providing the Kriyas were a danger to the community. However, what the government claimed it possessed and what it actually possessed, as usual, were two very different things. Teller of Tales. During much of his undercover work, Spinelli tried to paint a different picture of himself than who he really was, a nobody liar. After all, he was playing a role. 
In February 2017, a month before the May indictment, Spinelli tried to stir up trouble with his new business partner by bringing up Sean Richard, a subject that was a sore spot for Detello. No matter what their previous dealings, Detello had been betrayed by a friend, and Spinelli milked Detello's feelings for all they were worth. On February 12, 2017, Spinelli encouraged Detello to speak to Crea about the Richardson situation. Apparently, Spinelli had convinced Detello to go looking for Richard, but Detello remembered Crea had previously said, don't go near him. Spinelli urged him on anyway. Stevie would have been so happy if you did that, believe me, Spinelli said, but Detello wasn't convinced, responding, I don't know. It was clear that Richard stayed on Detello's mind as it appeared he had gone to Korea anyway to talk about Richard. On February 21st, 2017, Detello told Spinelli, the thing you told me, Korea wasn't receptive to it, wasn't receptive to it, it's a federal it's a federal informant. He added that Korea told him, don't fuck with him because he ruined your life once already. Spinelli wasn't giving up. In a conversation on March 8, 2017, Spinelli told Detello to go to New Hampshire to find Richard despite what Stevie says. You know what Spinelli said? You got to make this fucking decision. However, Detello resisted telling Spinelli once again, Crea told me not to and said the idea was crazy and we're talking about a fucking informant. Despite knowing all that and getting caught in their lies during prior bail hearings, the prosecution proclaimed that a March 22, 2017 recording had all the proof they needed. They said that Spinelli had asked Detello if Crea had been bothering him about the attempt on Richard's life, and Detello replied, he's keeping back. He's keeping back. This was to back up the government's claim that Crea had told Detello to hold off on the hit because of the heat on the family. Just to be clear, this evidence was presented to Cybele at the hearings in transcript form. The defense hadn't received the actual recordings, but when they did, they learned that Detello's actual words were quite different. While the government claimed Detello said, he's keeping back, he's keeping back, what Detello actually said was, he's a pretty good guy, he's a pretty good guy. In other words, once again, the government had manipulated the evidence and lied to the court to suit their needs. And then there was this which gives a clear look to how Spinelli, working behalf on the government, was trying his hardest to please his employer and implicate Crea. Spinelli, yeah, I wanted Stevie to know because I know that Stevie wouldn't let nothing like that go, you know? And he's not supposed to. Detello, right, well they do. When it comes to informants, they, they don't want to know nothing about it. They don't either. Spinelli, really? Detello, yeah. Spinelli failed at this task, but the dark truth of the attempted murder and assault of Sean Richard was just beginning to unravel and wouldn't be fully revealed until October of 2019. Frame job. On September 27, 2018, Gangnam reported an exclusive story about how Detello had found Sean Richard. The informant was from a report Capisci obtained from the FBI. In the report, Detello had explained that someone had contacted his daughter, through her Facebook page and told her that Richard was living in New Hampshire and gave her his new address, name, and everything. The teller was suspicious, telling Spinelli, it's weird how I got him, but he called the girl who gave his daughter the information to confirm its authenticity and ask why she was doing it. She told him, I don't care what you do to him. I hate him. Gangland speculated that Spinelli and the FBI agents used a clever scam to get Detello to talk about his 2016 effort to whack Richard and his intention to kill him no matter how long it took. They did it by coming up with a cockamamie story that Spinelli had found out where a cooperating witness who had testified against Spinelli was living and that their friend Pete had found Spinelli's rat. Spinelli said he had a Christmas tree farm in upstate New York. Pete found a lot of information on Facebook in 90 minutes. Gangnam might have called it a clever scam, but in truth it seems like a frame job in the spirit of Scarper and Bulger. And while Detello never found this quarry, one does have to speculate what would have happened if he did and who would have been ultimately to blame if something dire had actually happened to Richard. Like cockroaches scurrying from the light. 
The shady tactics of the FBI once again hit the spotlight in November 15, 2018 Gangland exclusive article. Gangland reported that on August 14, 2014, Spinelli forgot to turn off his recording device and recorded a conversation between FBI secret agent Pete and FBI super agent Otto discussing a meeting Pete and Spinelli had with Brian Vaughn, another defendant in the case who ended up taking a plea from the government. Peter was pleased with the outcome of the meeting, telling Otto they were certain they could convince Vaughn to commit the crimes they were setting him up for despite Vaughn's resistance. He fits with our story, Pete said. We will get Brian good and we'll open the door for cocaine. We have to look at the bigger picture, Pete continued. It was a good day, a very good day. We're beginning to open the door with him. James DiPietro and Joseph Gentile, who were Vaughn's lawyers at the time, disclosed the recordings before Vaughn's sentencing. Despite Cybell being aware of their existence, she did not have anything to say about the FBI's repeated pressure to make Vaughn do a drug deal he steadily rejected. Cybell ended up sentencing Vaughn to seven years, six months, more than the suggested maximum. But there's more. Apparently, Spinelli's tape recorder never stopped. After a meeting with Datello on the same day, Pete was caught on tape talking about Datello saying, so if we can get him to facilitate something where he can implicate some guys here, that would be good. As they were driving away from Datello's house talking about their next meeting with him on August 18, Pete gave Spinelli further insight into the FBI's way of thinking. So you see, a lot of times, you know, when we do this type of stuff, it's very much like playing chess, right? So you're looking to, you see any, you call that planting a seed. And that in the future, three, four, five moves from now, that seed may grow into something else. You have to wonder if Pete had recently read Peter Lance's book, Deal with the Devil, the FBI's secret 30-year relationship with a mob killer, which was published in July the previous year. In an interview with U.S. News and World Report, Lance said, what a Machiavellian strategist he was. What a chess player. After being asked what surprised him most during the research on Gregory Scarpa Sr., perhaps that was on Pete's mind when he made the comment about playing chess. A bit of meldish gossip a la spineless Spinelli, a side story. As we previously discussed, Spinelli interjected Stevie so much into his conversation that one might think he actually knew the guy. But it was all a glass pipe dream of his, a starry-eyed wish that would never come true. No matter who he tried talking to and no matter the subject, Stevie was always on the tip of Spinelli's tongue. It's surprising that no one ever asked Spinelli if he had a secret crush on the guy. But this constant Stevie fascination was a serious matter when it came to the government trying to prove Korea's involvement in any of the crimes which he was charged, especially the murder of Michael Meldish. On October 30, 2014 recording, James Mafucci, a co-defendant in the case, shot Spinelli down when he wouldn't shut up about Stevie. Spinelli, what's up with Stevie? Can I go to Stevie myself with this fucking situation? Mafucci said, Stevie who? Do you know him? Spinelli goes, no, no. Mafucci goes, how are you going to go see him? Spinelli goes, you know, you know what? It's done. Mafucci goes, it's all over. It's done. And it's none of our business. Spinelli, right, it's none of my business. Mafucci, I mean this I mean this is conversation. Mafucci, I mean this is conversation. Spinelli goes, We're having, we're gossiping. Mafucci, right. But apparently Spinelli wasn't done gossiping about Stevie to end the murder. One of the most damning recordings the government claimed it possessed was of Mafucci stating Creel was directly involved. But once again, the government lied. What Mafucci really said to Spinelli on March 7, 2017 recording was this. I don't think that Stevie had anything to do with Meldish's murder. And just like Spinelli, the government kept going and going. Their Pinocchio nose getting longer and longer. All right, we're going to end it right here for now. This is part five of the Stephen Crea story. Guilt for the Guiltless, the story of Stephen Crea and the murder of Michael Meldish and other tales. And remember on June 5th, www.guiltfortheguiltless.com. The audio book will be out and you can go to the website to listen to it. So I'm going to try to put as much parts as I can of this. I'm really grateful to uh, the you know the crew over there at the button guys of the New York Mafia.com. Salute to you for letting me put up these uh, videos. We appreciate it. It helps us grow our library as well. And, uh, you know, we promote each other. So, uh, for, uh, you know, so 
First of all, salute to uh, Justice Tech Pros and Dominic and the whole team over there. Thank you very much. Mob Story Season 2. Salute to Lisa Babic, a.k.a. MS, for this great article. This is part five of the Stephen Crea story, Guilt for the Guiltless, the story of Stephen Crea, the murder of Michael Meldish, and other tales. Gentlemen, you know the rules. Like, comment, share, wipe your feet on the rug, and we will talk soon. Salute.